This is Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Subscribe for new content notifications. Now, here's Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow me on Twitter at Backup Bradley Above at the top of the screen and everything that we're talking about here today. So I've gotten a few messages and I've been seeing a lot of newer people coming into space over the last few months. So this will be fun for people who've been in the space for a while. And this will really be fun for anybody who's fairly new to the space also. So and if you've been in the space a while, don't sleep on this. Stay with us as we walk through it, because there may be a thing or two you're not aware of in here. So what we're going to do is like just every once in a while, it's good to go through and make sure we're all not hyping each other up a tree and that we understand what it is we hold, just how massive it is. And from my personal perspective, the reason I believe that we're still experiencing low prices is strictly because of a couple of things. One, it, XRP has not gotten the clarity or the designation of what the asset actually is as of yet. Number two, if you understand what XRP is designed and you supposed to be used for, you know that it currently, in great order, has not b been used in that fashion. Now, it's been proven through MoneyGram and the example, the real live example of what it can do as an advantage as a bridge currency asset and what it can do for remittances. And I think that example could be extrapolated into the financial world as well. Um, but it's it's not there yet. You know, in the early days of the Internet, there were several trillion dollars into the Internet, but we haven't even got a trillion dollar total market cap collectively in the entire crypto space as of yet. I believe, again, coming back to what I've said a lot on this channel for a very long time, is I believe XRP is not just another digital asset in the digital asset space. It is a digital asset that will become a part of the framework of the entire digital asset space. And that is one of the reasons why I'm invested in it and one of the main reasons and primarily the reason why I covered it heavily on the channel as I could have done anything. I could have covered a lot of different things, other cryptos, whatever, and at times we do. But that is one of the primary features. We're going to look at some of that evidence right now. So first of all, we start with Kristalina Georgieva at the G7 meeting today. I commended the finance ministers for their continuing support for the economy until a durable exit from the pandemic. Together, David Malpass from the World Bank. I urge more resources for poor countries and further action on debt. Now, we're going to look at this because I covered this about a potential debt jubilee globally, and I covered the idea about you know, a debt jubilee would be debt forgiveness, right? Well, in that video or two that I've covered in the past, and you can go back and put in, you know, IMF debt jubilee or um, Nassar Jassara, and you could see a real look at what some debt forgiveness may look like. And this is where it starts. It starts with the DSSI, which is the Debt Service Suspension Initiative. We covered this back in June or July, whenever it was. David Malpass and the work at the uh, World Bank continues. And basically, you go through here and it says, going forward, we recognize that some countries will need further debt treatment. In addition to DSSI's liquidity relief to restore debt sustainability. In this context, we support the development of common framework for future debt treatments beyond the debt service, uh, its suspension initiative, that's what it is, to be agreed by the G20 Paris Club by the time of October's G20 finance ministers. Now, in October, there's a lot of things happening, right? It's the beginning of a fiscal year and a fourth quarter. Um, so we'll see what goes on there with the IMF and other entities that have meetings there, as well as the G20. G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting in October. The framework should set out provisions for the scope of creditor participation, transparency, and call for coordinated debt relief on a case-by-case -case basis in the context of a full-fledged IMF program. The framework should ensure 
fair burden sharing among all official bilateral creditors and debt relief by private creditors at least as favorable as the provided by the official bilateral creditors. It should also lay the foundation for a sound and robust financing practices in the future, including transparency and governance. We strongly urge official bilateral creditors to support and adhere to such G20 Paris Club framework to set clear expectations for all. And what they're talking about is a debt suspension for the countries that are in trouble and for the uh, the holder of that debt to work with those countries to give them what they need to delay that that loan or that money that's owed until I believe it's the end of 2021, if my memory serves me right from reading the article a short time ago here. So, And we're looking at the tune of about uh, the DSSI, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, currently right now, has been fundamental in supporting 43 countries across the globe. 43 countries. Now, I've said this before and just said it the other day even. When we hear this term level playing field being used from everyone from everywhere, I don't know how you have a level playing field if you're going to introduce a new financial monetary system and payment rails without dealing with the debt, especially the debt of the United States, which, you know, obviously the U.S. has been, you know, uh, the Federal Reserve and the U.S. have obviously been less than desirable when it comes to fiscal stability and fiscal discipline. There's no argument there. But you also have to really factor in the fact that if, in fact, in October, we run the risk of the IMF talking about making an external adjustment to the exchange rate peg of the U.S. dollar and other dominant currencies, you really have to start to ask yourself, because the U.S. dollar has served as a global reserve currency, will there be some sort of debt forgiveness because of the dollar playing that role to the world. I would think there has to be some sort of a trade-off there. Now, it doesn't mean 100% debt uh, relief or or forgiveness, right, or cancellation. It could be a 20 or 30% haircut on the debt, right? So we'll have to see based on what happens, if anything at all, with the exchange rate peg of the U.S. dollar after the IMF meets in October. Okay, so going forward, we see the World Economic Forum, which has an entire agenda about what they call the Great Reset, right? Uh, Knowing where we're at here, this is how we can get great great real value from infrastructure. I just wanted to highlight through the World Economic Forum here that they do go through here and talk about new infrastructure, and the economic infrastructure is one of those layers as well as the social and natural environment. So these uh, infrastructures, and they deal with these by a point-by-point basis. They talk about digitization, a focus on developing cyber, cyber physical system, and they talk about the fact that currently right now it is a system of many systems that are going on, which really just leans heavily into the idea that whatever we go to, which I firmly believe will be uh, the XRP Ledger and certainly other networks as well, but certainly for this conversation, XRP Ledger is one of them, the ILP. I think what we're talking about here is interoperability, right? And it's that interoperability, just as Brad Garlinghouse recently stated, that will be what determines the winners, especially when it comes to CBDCs in the world. So let's keep moving because then it goes far back is to think about where Ripple's been. You know, 2015, the Federal Federal Payments Task Force was developed by the Federal Reserve. And, you know, and this is from 2017 from Ripple site. We know that they were recommended as one of the best uh, uh, offerings to a new financial payment system. Let's keep it going. Then you have to start looking at just, and look, we're just doing like a quick kind of brief overview, right? So just to kind of, you know, dial it in while things are 23 cents, right? (laughs) You know, then there was Susan Friedman who left the U.S. Treasury to come work at a startup like Ripple. And you start asking yourself, wow, you know, that's pretty impressive. And then Craig Phillips from the U.S. Treasury did the same exact thing. Well, damn. 
That's pretty compelling, too. I know. Because before either one of them came over, Michael S. Barr from the U.S. Treasury came over in 2015 to work for Ripple. These people left incredible jobs to come work at Ripple. Miguel Viez ran the gold desk at CME and leaves that job and comes to work at Ripple. Are you kidding me? It's remarkable, the level of people. Let's just look at some of the board members for a minute. Ken Curson. Well, this is interesting, too. Ben Lawski, who wrote the bit license in New York, right, ends up coming to work for Ripple. Ken Curson happens to be a really close friend with the family of the Trump family. The president's uh, family friend is now on the board with Ripple. Now, if you've been in this space for any length of time, you know this stuff. But let's push it on home and take it where it needs to go here. Last January 2020, Brad Garlinghouse goes to the World Economic Forum. They come out with a central bank digital currency policy toolmaker kit, which I show a lot on this channel because it's significant. And I'm not going to come off of it because it's significant. Where in that document on page 17, you can see clearly the most relevant for wholesale CBDC, central bank digital currencies, which is exactly what we're talking about being developed. 70% of central banks are developing and deploying central bank digital currencies. And according to the last World Economic Forum, XRP is clearly cited here as an asset that is designed for inter and intrabank payment and settlement. Oddly enough, the woman that created this document, courtesy of Mickey B. Fresh, the woman that created this document was Sheila Warren. She is from the World Economic Forum, and she is going to be a keynote speaker at this year's Swell. Come on in. Then there was this document that uh, Mickey B. Fresh and myself went over. This is the International Monetary Fund, as you can see at the top. United States Financial Sector Assessment Program, Technical Note Supervision of Financial Market Infrastructure, Resilience, and so on and so on. And this is a IMF PDF document that inside of this document cites RippleNet like six or seven different times. And basically it goes through here, and I'll highlight just a couple places for you. Only very few new players aim to challenge established payment infrastructures. Some of the new payment platforms aim to compete with payment systems such as TCH, ACH, TCH, RTP, and the Fedwire Fund Service, which are only accessible by banks. For example, RippleNet provides the software and the rule book for a transfer mechanism, whereas financial intermediaries function as nodes and may partake in the consensus mechanism. These players offer a payment infrastructure outside the traditional U.S. payment system. Both of the U.S. dollars and other virtual currencies may be using DLT as a platform. And I guess it's saying both for the U.S. But anyway, moving forward, let's just look at a couple other spots because this entire document is straight fire. And let's go down to, I wanted to go to this page 42. I'm skipping over incredible stuff. In this document, it is basically recommending, again, that FSOC, right here, let me just give you a piece of it. Um, let me jump in right here. So card payment schemes are not considered to be retail payment infrastructures. I'll go from here. Uh, and have not been designated as systemically important by FSOC, which is a regulatory body connected to the Treasury, the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Despite processing payments with annual values of trillions of dollars through multilateral arrangements based on common rule books, and despite Visa considering itself to be a global payment system, RippleNet is designed as a wholesale payment system without being subject to payment system specific requirements other than requirements posed by banks 
There is, however, some limited scrutiny by FinCEN and the Federal Reserve. There is no dedicated regulatory regime for new types of digital services such as gateway services, APIs, NFC access, or digital wallet services. Consequently, opinion letters or guidance by authorities to provide certainty on the interpretation of existing rules to these new types of services may be needed. It says, I mean, it is the, the recommendation from an IMF document here, and it goes through the example of showing MoneyGram is using RippleNet to channel remittance payments. Digital products such as DLT networks are also offered to use technical platforms on which payment arrangements operate and with provisions of network services, financial institutions being based on non-negotiable rule books and conditions. And it goes on and on and on and on. The International Monetary Fund really highlighting RippleNet and recommending that it get basically a designation from the Treasury Department regulatory body, FSOC, that it's systemically important to the financial system. Uh, this has been something I've been pounding the ground on for over a year, if not almost two years now. Now, Going on to the next thing here, we have to ask ourselves, where does all of this come from? How does Brian Brooks from the OCC, another regulatory agency connected to the Treasury, get to be so bold and sure and confident? Because I don't feel that it's arrogance. I feel that it's confidence. There's a huge difference between the two. Fine line, but a huge difference between the two. And he's a confident man. And I believe that he's confident not only because he's great at his job and he understands this space to an extremely high level. Those things are first and foremost. But I also believe it's much easier to understand this space when there's an executive order 13772 on the core principles for regulating the United States financial system. It is an executive order that was signed by the President Trump back in 2017, the eighth executive action by the President during his first 100 days in office. That's how long this has been going on even before he got here. But this has certainly been a working point for this administration since they got in office. So this is really about upgrading the entire government system and the financial system with blockchain and cryptocurrency where applicable in short. OK, so with that being said, I want to show you if you have not seen it, this is Prosper that is shown here in the executive order as a list of companies that are here, as well as PayPal, which have cited in a congressional hearing, they could be using XRP to their benefit and their business model right now, if they were allowed to do so, or felt that they were clear in the sense that they wouldn't have any liability or I guess, any gray areas about how they could use that in that business model. Then Ripple and R3 are cited here, as well as Western Union and MoneyGram. SoFi, which is interestingly enough, was just recently listed on Link2's platform for private equity, uh, private investing made simple on there. Now you got to be an accredited investor to buy on there, but I will tell you, you know, um, you can register for free and I don't think it's a bad idea. I don't know about you, but I don't get up every day and just plan on how my life's going to be today. I have things I need to do today, but I'm working towards a goal. And that goal for me is to be an accredited investor. That goal for me is to be a venture capitalist at some point. And I don't know, it doesn't have to be the same for everybody, but if it is for you, I would register for that app and I would register with that company. The app is free. Now, with that being said, you know, when I look at all of this cumulative information that we've just taken a look at here, I have to say to myself, because this is something that is very true about me. I hate losing more than I like winning. And in a space that we've been invested in this long, that has been down this long, because I believe it is still that new and we are still that early. It only takes a few decisions of regulatory clarity to unlock enormous amounts of money and wealth to invest heavily in this space. This is not financial advice. It is just my perspective on what I've learned up until this point as an investor in this space and an observer 
in this space and someone who is very passionate about where I believe this space is going ultimately. But if you're going to remain in this space and you're going to have the wherewithal to get through this, you can't just like winning because winning isn't good enough because for over three years, we haven't been winning. So the reality is to me is that you have to hate losing more than you like winning in order to stick this out. But that's not financial advice, and I'm not a financial advisor, and that is going to do it for me. Guys, make sure you hit the like and subscribe. This really does come down to let's do the math, and I don't mean the physical numbers, but the fundamentals. Let's add up these fundamentals. Let's find out exactly where we are here, and what is this company, Ripple, and what is this asset XRP, and did I just see enough in the last 20 minutes or so that just in short, just in 20 minutes to tell me that maybe just maybe there is something here and maybe just maybe if I did stack my pennies next to somebody else's dollars I might have to wait until they go to get their dollars back right so that's where I'm at today guys hit the like and subscribe leave a, a comment below make sure you share with somebody you know I hope you all have a great weekend keep an eye out for videos over the weekend and I will catch all of you in the next one take care